Thank you very much. Um, it's a tremendous honor to be here at this conference devoted to um, Frank Mel's birthday. You are very young. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I don't have to repeat what people before me so eloquently said, how influential Frank was, but I do want to say a few personal things. I was lucky to join the University of Chicago in 2005 and this was around the time when I think you started coming. So let me try and borrow um, just for a minute or two a page out of Thierry's book, the quantum mechanical talk. And so let Psi Franck of Tx be Franck's wave function. So we're all complicated people, we're complex. Of course, this is complex valued. That is why we need a self-adjoint operator. And so we measure Franck as a function of time like this. So this is, let me abbreviate, Franck. And so how do we pick this self-adjoint operator? Well, let this be Eckhart Hall at the University of Chicago. So let's take a smooth bump function around Eckhart Hall and then these are the observations I made about Franck's visits as function of time. You would come then there was an exponential tail. And at the beginning, I thought this is a periodic function in time, but this is too easy. <laughs> so I never figured out the law of your visits, whether they were <laughs> random or quasi-periodic. But interestingly enough, even when you weren't there, this was positive. So you tunneled from Paris. <laughs> and then <laughs> it's a unique continuation principle. And I don't know, maybe we should have a chat as to Sometimes you came in the spring, but then didn't you come back in the fall sometimes? And then you disappeared for three weeks, so there was a double resonance. <laughs> um, there was a conservation law, namely if you integrate it over one year period, then this was, I think, a conserved quantity. <laughs> By the way, um, coming back to this, I have a little theory. You might have noticed there's so much fake news in the world. Where does it come from? It comes from non-self-adjoint operators because if A star is minus A, then this is imaginary. So the real part is zero, right? So if the real part is zero, it's completely fake. <laughs> so, all right, well, enough of this. Um, it's hard to follow Simon in a geometry talk, especially for a non-geometer like myself. I'll still try, so I'll talk about the ancient relative of the Ricci flow that Simon presented. This is the gradient flow of the Dirichlet energy, and I will only be in two dimensions. This is the critical dimension for the, for the heat flow. Energy is conformally invariant in this case. The Gradient flow was introduced a long time ago by Ilse and Samson for geometric reasons. They, I think they wanted to study harmonic maps in fixed homotopic, homotopic classes. And so here is the heat equation. Ut is the projection of the Laplacian. We view U as a map into a Euclidean space, so it's a vector. The Laplacian is the standard Laplacian, the PDE Laplacian. The nonlinear term you get by projecting onto the tangent space at U, as usual. And for the purposes of this talk, it's enough if you consider U0 to be smooth initial data. The right-hand side of this heat flow, the harmonic map heat flow, is called the tension. Um, and as is typical in heat type equations, you also see the same if you take, say, a damp dispersive equation, is dissipation of energy. This will play a huge role. Um, years ago, Struve, 85, showed um, that this has an evolution in a certain sense. He identified the singularity, so more about this in a moment. The, um, the stationary time independent solutions that somehow we expect to converge to in, in infinite time, if exists in infinite time, harmonic maps. So. 
Here is Struve's theorem. He stated this for general manifolds. We will stick to the R2 and S2, but it's stated here a bit more generally. So take initial data in H.1. N is viewed as an embedded manifold, so you don't have to worry here. We don't have an L infinity um, continuous embedding from H1 to L infinity. You don't need it you can define h.1 as functions that almost everywhere take their values in the manifold since we're viewing n as embedded. Then Struve noted that, say for smooth data, you have a global smooth evolution but up to finitely many singularities at which he identified loss of compactness and regularity and that is through energy concentration. I should really point out here that um, the names will appear later on the slide, but it was Karen Ulmbeck who discovered this phenomenon of bubbling. And I recently watched at least a brief moment of a YouTube presentation that they had at the Institute for Advanced Study on Fleur Homology. And at the question was moderated, the talk was by um, Helmut Hoffel, and then um, Karen spoke and she said, I discovered bubbling. And to this day, it's hard. But for the young people, she, she said, they grow up with it, so it's like second nature. But it, this is really, she's right, this is an amazing phenomenon. And as we heard all week, plays a huge role in the theory that Carlos and Frank developed. Um, singularities can indeed form. This is this well-known paper by Changding and Ye in 92. They indeed constructed um, finite time blow up. Later we will see also the work of Raphael and Schwer on um, blow up. So an absolutely fundamental theorem here is this Ching bubbling theorem from, is it 95? What it does, it says that along a sequence of times, so this is the analog, if you want, of what Carlos explained in Sergi Pontoise on, on Wednesday, the sequential soliton resolution. This is sequential soliton resolution. So you go up to, say, the first singularity in time. It's located at x0. And then along a carefully chosen sequence of times, where does this come from? It comes from this energy dissipation inequality. The fact that your gradient is L2 in both space and time. So you then pick a sequence. We will have this where in a, on a later side where the tension vanishes. And when the tension vanishes, that gives you elliptic control. It's a palismale condition. So be it as it may, the theorem says that you have harmonic spheres. These are harmonic maps from R2 to S2. But you can resolve the singularity at infinity. And then the energy splits. So you have equipartition of the energy. Ut0 would be the weak limit of the harmonic map heat flow into time T0 in the energy sense. And then you have this, these bubbles of energy. Um, S2 here is special because the energy is quantized. So it will be 4 pi times the absolute value of the degree. Depending on the orientation, it can be positive or negative. And moreover, you have this typical description of what bubbling looks like. So the energy must concentrate in these bubbles. Those are the omega k. You subtract the value at infinity. And then you have an error in the energy <coughs> sense. And this is a local, only a local statement. This is false globally. Globally, the harmonic map heat flow does not satisfy the pelle smell condition, but locally. Um, these scales lambda kn have to tend to zero and the centers a k n have to tend to this one singularity. And there is an orthogonality condition and this orthogonality condition is the well-known one that features exactly the same as say in Pierre Felstock yesterday where he had the elliptic profile decomposition. Uh, so here is the orthogonality of the scales, either the scales lambda on the previous slide, so either the lambdas are radically different or if the lambdas are comparable, then these centers have to be radical. They have to diverge from each other relative to these scales. And so these pictures are taken directly, cut and paste out of Ching's 
95 paper. Let me try and explain. They might look a bit counterintuitive because our harmonic map heat flow takes its value in the sphere. Nevertheless, Ching drew kind of a big sphere with spheres attached. This is how the, this bubbling is visualized. It's not to be taken literally. And the key in, in Ching's theorem, which then was followed up um, by numerous papers, they will be listed in a moment, is to show that no energy can concentrate in the next. So in the next, the energy has to evacuate. This particular picture from Ching shows comparable scales and separate centers. The next one shows, um, yeah, shows the same center but radically different scales. This is bubble on bubble. All right, so a word about harmonic maps, even though this has more information than I need in my work with um, Yendre and Laurie. We don't really, at the moment, need the description by rational functions, but let's briefly review these remarkable properties. In two dimension only, do you have weakly harmonic maps um, being equal to classically harmonic maps, smooth? Um, also very surprising to me at first was that critical points of the energy have to be minimizers in the homotopy class. All right. Moreover, from the harmonic map equation, which is a second order equation, you can deduce, seems magical, first order Cauchy-Riemann system, the plus and minus, don't ask me which is which, um, one is conformal, the other one is anti-conformal. And as I said here, they are, they are the unique minimizers in the homotopy class of the energy. The energy is quantized, is 4 pi times the absolute value of the degree. And moreover, you can say why, because you see Cauchy-Riemann, it means you're conformal from the sphere to the sphere. It's well known what that is. Those are the rational functions precisely. And so the degree is the maximum of the degrees of the reduced numerator denominator polynomial. And moreover, there is something remarkable. It's on the bottom of the page. Let me start with that. That's the Bogomolmi identity. It says that the excess of the energy over 4 pi times the absolute value of the degree. So this is written here, I suppose, for the positive orientations of 4 pi degree is exactly the L2 failure of Cauchy-Riemann. All right? So the first integral vanishes if and only if you satisfy Cauchy-Riemann. What's on the top of the page is, um, how do you do this? Well, there is the hardest part turns out to be this Heller regularity theorem. What you need to prove is that weakly harmonic maps are continuous. If you look in Heller's book, you will see that he then says that the rest is kind of standard elliptic regularity. This is quite interesting. And the way I, I understand it is that you have this, basically you have an equation Laplace f equals g. If g is in L1, just think of the fundamental solution, which is a delta. It's the limit of L1 approximate identity. So you can't hope to have L-infinity control from L1. But if this is in the Hardy space, h1, then in two dimensions, then you have an L-infinity bound. And that's not easy. This um, has a strong resonance here with France. This Kaufmann, Lyons, Mayer, Sem's paper, absolutely remarkable, the difficult Andrea knows it well. <laughs> um, the diff coil structure, and they discovered how the nonlinearity actually has this compensated compactness structure and allows you to prove that this actually is highly non trivial in the Hardy space H1. Be it as it may, there is a geometric quantity, the Hopf quadratic differential. The quadratic differential is only. Um, by design, do you add the dz squared so that it scales? Okay, so in, by scaling, this is a quadratic differential. The function phi is holomorphic. And because of compactness, this Hopf differential has to vanish. That is where you get the, um, the Cauchy Riemann from. So, just like in both of your work, there is a Liouville theorem here that is absolutely crucial that turns a second order equation into first order one. And so, on this slide, what I try to do is 
to state kind of the um, state of the art, too many states, so that is the soliton, the sequential soliton resolution theorem that we use. Notice that it improves upon, by work of the authors listed on the bottom, the energy also to L infinity. Okay, so remarkably, you can show that this resolution that UN is what the omega zero, that's a harmonic map, it's a, the weak limit by a suitable rescaling by rho n <coughs> plus the other bubbles, this converges to zero locally on disks, but also uniformly in L infinity. Okay? So, and notice the condition on the top of the page. What is T U N? That is the tension, that is the right hand side of the harmonic map heat flow, is Laplacian U plus grad U squared U the projection of the Laplacian onto the tension plane. And most important is this rho n that sits in front of it. That is the scaling. And this scaling is, you can view it in space and time, but because of the parabolic nature, of course, um, it, you can move from one to the other, from time to space. And what you see here is that you get this bubbling decomposition on disks of size rho n. Needless to say that the top condition, the tension condition, you can multiply <coughs> by a sequence r intending to infinity, it will still hold along a subsequence, everything up to subsequences. And so that's where the big r intending to infinity comes from. It gives you some leeway. You need this flexibility. And so you have these harmonic maps. They are non-constant, of course. You have orthogonality of scales as before, either the mu j n have to diverge from each other or the centers have to diverge relative to the mu j n. Notice that the top condition is vacuously satisfied if the u n happen to be harmonic maps to begin with and the tension vanishes. That means that theorem will hold for any rho n. And in fact, bubbling for harmonic maps was done, this name is perhaps missing down there, by Parker in the early 90s. He preceded uh, Ching, it was simultaneous with Ching, and he did this for bubbling of harmonic maps themselves. Um, you s the third bullet point down there says that, of course, you want to stay away from the boundary, so you finagle always in such a way that you don't hit the boundary of the disk where you're actually working. The last bullet point is fundamentally important. That's a property of the sphere that we can talk about the number of bubbles k just by dividing the energy by 4 pi. That is fundamentally important. Okay? So this is sequential soliton resolution, both in H1 and L infinity. Um, very noteworthy, I already mentioned Ching on the bottom, but then Ding Tian, no, Ching Tian, Ding Tian revisited the energy and redid a certain the vanishing of energies in the neck by different methods. Very important, but not surprising to the expert, is some Poiseuille identity, <coughs> actually. You integrate by parts per x dot grad in many of you. So in this community, you speak of this as virial. We speak of this as um, virial. That's elliptic is Poiseuille. Ching Tian were the ones, to the best of my knowledge, who added the pointwise d. The necklessness, which geometrically is very important because it says that the image is connected. You have a connected <laughs> image in the limit. So here is a childish rendition of what the geometry looks like. You have the big disk, this is R and rho n, and inside you would have the scales of the harmonic bubbles. So this is a picture in R2, this is not in the target, this is in the pre-image. And you can have bubbles inside of bubbles, it's complicated, just like um, we're used to also from dispersive equations. So what this slide attempts to explain is how to use two, which is this all-important dissipation of the energy. It's this, this is the key, just like in if you have a damped dispersive equation, you will have this property, but for u index t, right? So this is absolutely crucial. And you see now where this, the sequences of times comes from in, in Ching, in the previous slide, the bubbling slide. Well, you, if you have two and time is infinite, then you just pick a sequence of times such that that 
root tn times L2 norm tends to zero. If it's finite, then you have this other limit. Then you apply this sequential soliton resolution, and you see that you can do this at, at these scales. Globally in time, you get the parabolic scale root tn, or you get the reverse parabolic scale root big T minus tn. And there you have the Pallis-Mail condition. And you can bubble both in energy and uniformly along those sequences of times at these scales. So here are some open problems, to the best of my knowledge, open to this day. They're mentioned in these fundamental 90s papers. Is the body map in finite time, which is a weak limit, continuous? In fact, Topping proved that if you pick this very sensitive to the target, if you pick a non-analytic target, it fails. Um, you also lose the uniqueness if you mess with the target. Um, then there is the, the question of concentration of energy. Are these points unique or do they depend on the sequence of times? You see, this is really the underlying issue here, is that the 90s literature only controls this process by a sequence of times. I showed you how to select them from energy dissipation. That is how you get your palace smell. And then everything depends on the sequence of times you chose. And you immediately have these uniqueness problems. Topping in Warwick made fundamental contributions. I tried to sketch here um, in that theorem some of his results. For example, he showed that if all the bubbles have the same orientation, then you have a uniqueness of these points. Okay, so now what we're really after is not imposing any conditions, but before I do that, let me state this very recent theorem of Jacek Yende and Andrew Lorry about equivariant harmonic map heat flow. I should be quick to add that these results by Jacek and, and Andy are rooted in their work in, on wave maps. So even though one might think one should start with harmonic maps and then go to wave maps, it was the exact opposite, that the harder problem was addressed first. And the ideas they developed there are absolutely essential for this work that I'm describing for harmonic map heat flow. So what did they prove? They proved that if you have an equivariant solution, that means the usual thing, you have the sphere and you introduce this azimuth angle, I believe that is called psi. And the equivariant condition simply means is that the action of SO2 on the domain commutes through into the target. All right, so you, and the commute is not completely correct. That's for k equals 1. If you have higher k, then you wrap around k times. That's the equivariant k k's. And before I had mentioned that harmonic maps are rational functions. So if they're equivariant rational functions, there can only be two kinds, this and z bar to the k, orientation preserving, orientation reversing. And if you write them in this angle, then they take the form 2 arctan r to the k. And so this is what they prove. They prove that you have uniformly in time, in continuous time, you have these scales, and your solution to the harmonic map heat flow decomposes this is for infinite time, into a sum of bubbles. If you do the calculation, this just with the trigonometric identities here, you'll see that irrespective the plus minus doesn't change the degree. Okay? Think about that because if you change the sine of theta in the first line, um, you reverse uh, the sine of psi in the first line, you reverse the sine of the first two components. So the determinant is 1, minus 1, minus 1, 1. Um, if you look at this more carefully with the subsequent bubbles, you'll see that they all have opposite orientation. So any two subsequent equivariant bubbles have opposite orientation. So this is the opposite of topping. Topping wanted equal orientation. All right. A bit of the history, important papers. So van der Hout um, did the case of finite time and you don't have bubble towers, so one bubble. Um, Delpinio Musovei looked at the energy critical 
heat equation power nonlinearity, more relevant for this talk is the work of Davila del Pinoway, who constructed, of course, non-equivariantly on a bounded domain with you know parabolic Dirichlet conditions. They constructed blow-up solutions with several degree one maps glued together. And let me start with Gustafsson Nakanishi Tsai. They showed some years ago stability of the harmonic maps for k greater or equal 3, so in particular no blow-up, k is the equivalence class, k equals 2, they showed the existence of etern what they called eternally oscillating solutions, k equals 1 they left open, that was filled in by Raphael and Schreyer, who constructed by QB plus epsilon techniques um, blow-up solutions, stable, in a certain sense stable blow-up solutions. So now what we're after, and this will take some work, is to describe this new work. It's been an archive for a couple of weeks. Fundamental, so with um, Jacek, who's here, and, and Andrew Laurie, fundamentally builds on their wave map paper using the idea of a minimal collision energy, which will come in a moment. But in order to kind of set the stage, we need to get a handle on these complicated harmonic maps. We will not use the structure of rational functions, at least not yet. I should emphasize we don't do modulation theory. We tried, that is hard. So we're building that wave function. That, that's a hard one. Um, you'll see what the theorem says in a moment. So let's describe the scale associated with a harmonic map. Not so surprising, you go to such a big disk with a suitable center that you take 99.9% .9 of the energy, say, or 90% of the energy of the whole thing. That will define a natural scale associated with the harmonic map. It's a bit delicate, be careful, because you might have a degree 2 map that has two degree 1s sitting far apart. Then the scale would be this. All right? But you will see later in the talk that we can also look at these individually because we will look at what we call um, multi-bubble configurations. Now, clearly, so center and scale, right, associated with a harmonic map. And an m-bubble configuration is what I wrote there. Our notation is script q here omega x. And omega zero is a constant. The omega j have non-vanishing energy, and we subtract as um, the authors in the 90s showed you have to do the value at infinity. And the constant maps here have to be allowed. This is the case of m equals zero when the sum vanishes. So what we're going to try and do, you'll see the theorem in a moment, is to say that continuously in time, the harmonic map heat flow <coughs> remains close to a multi-bubble configuration approaches a multi-bubble configuration for all times, not for a well-chosen sequence of times. And what does it mean to be close to multi-bubble configuration? So we have to introduce a distance, d, that measures the distance. And as you saw on the sequential um, solid and resolution slide, we have two senses in which we do this, energy and L infinity. L infinity is, of course, the harder one. So let me unravel this for you. I, tr I tried hard here. Um, we tried hard with, with Jacek and Andy to present this in a way that is least, um, least repulsive. <laughs> so the first bullet point is not a surprise. You want on, of course, on the scale rho, everything's local, the energy of u to be close to multi-bubble configuration. First bullet point, not a surprise. Then let me show you this very simple geometry. It's kind of a trivial picture. So the red one is dy rho. That is where I just showed you we want the energy of u to be globally on the disk close to the multi-bubble configuration. Then you need to give yourself wiggle room. In fact, you give yourself far away this blue disk, the outer blue disk, and then you zoom into the green disk. All the fine structure will be in the green disk, and this annulus, this very fat annulus between green and blue, we demand, and we will propagate this, of course, there will be propagation estimates in a moment, 
that you are close to a constant, all right? So all the action in the green disk and on this annulus, you're close to a constant in which sense, that's the second bullet point, that in the L-infinity sense, you're close to a constant and the energy is almost zero on that annular region. And the third bullet point just says in formulas what I said in words, that green is tiny and blue is enormous and the, the red one, which is the actual scale, rho is in the middle. Then as before you have orthogonality of the bubble, scales, lambda and centers are diverging, okay? Notice there is no n. So what I'm describing to you is what does it mean for the distance to be very small? Well, it means that these orthogonality conditions give you very big numbers, right? So lambda, like um, you both do in your, in your inventiones and active paper and so on, and how the elliptic people do this. Separation from exterior neck, well, of course, you want your um, scale, uh, that's the natural scale of the harmonic map, to be far away from um, these, the boundaries, okay? No surprises there. Then that's a bit delicate. How do we handle in our theorem about to be stated the uniformity? We cannot uniformly ha handle uniformity. We only handle it on a Swiss cheese region. So we have a bit of a complicated geometry. We then have to solve the heat equation on Swiss cheese region. So what's a Swiss cheese region? Here I tried showing this to you. So notice the green disk, the tiny one in the middle, is where all the action is in terms of bubbling. So I zoomed into the green. Then inside of the green, you have more bubbles. And the red ones are the actual harmonic maps drawn in their position and scale. And you surround them by um, disks of equal radius. Okay, congruent disk is perhaps the word I was looking for. So disks of equal radius. And it doesn't matter that the actual scale of the harmonic maps inside is perhaps much smaller. And notice here, I allow collisions of these This Later, you remove them by a covering argument. Of course, you would want everything to be well separated, but you can do that. So in terms of formulas, the dj star is you take the disk of the harmonic map omega j, you remove the inner life coming from the inner bubbles, but you don't remove it at the scale of the inner bubbles. You remove it at a concent not concentric, but congruent scale psi j. Okay, the picture showed you what I mean from this. Again, you want separation from the boundaries. You never want to collide with the boundaries. And then finally, if you put all these energy pieces, L infinity pieces together, L infinity only on Swiss cheese, do you get the delta? Delta is the infimum of all possible multi-bubble configurations. And then the theorem that we posted a few weeks ago says this, that if you take a smooth solutions of harmonic map heat flow up to the maximal time, that's where you cease to be smooth, that's <coughs> where the first Struve singularity sits, then that delta will tend to zero uniformly in time. And if the blow-up time is finite, then you do this on the inverted parabolic scale. Okay, here is the time um, t plus. Time infinite, you do it on the actual parabolic scale. That's root t. Moreover, this is very important, you can localize in, in the disk. So that's what the yn is. Okay, so you have translation invariance, so you can pick your centers to be arbitrary. Okay, and so what's the meaning of this? The meaning is that uniformly in time, you remain close to multi-bubble configuration and on the suitable scales, on these parabolic scales, but we do not control, we don't, we don't solve the uniqueness problem. We don't s solve the dynamics of the bubbles, right? That we do not control, that requires some form of modulation. So, as I said, there is an analogous result. In infinite time, we do not solve um, the uniqueness. What does the theorem say? It says really that there are no destructive bubble collisions. We will say more about this later. And 
In particular, you can, as a corollary, deduce from, this is our theorem 2 in the paper. If you open it, you'll see it's preceded by theorem 1, which says from every sequence of times, you can pick a subsequence along which you bubble. From every, it's the essential qualifier here, no mention of a Pallet-Smale condition. So, as Pierre Raphael so eloquently put yesterday, every proof starts with assume it's false, right? <laughs> um, how else could we do this? This is a large data result, it's not perturbative, so you proof by contradiction. Assume that you move away from these MBCs. These are multi-bubble configurations, but infinitely many times. So this way of thinking was so important for us, it really comes from dynamical systems, not to take too much time here, but um, if you look at the dynamical systems literature, in particular, also from the 90s, something like brunovsky Polochik, preceded by Chen, Hale, and Tan. What they look at is invariant manifold theory for ODEs, as, so flows and maps, but in infinite dimensions. There is a linearized operator with a gap condition and so on and so forth, leading to a decomposition into stable, unstable, and center manifold. And then this is an equilibrium, obviously. And then they say, imagine you have a tra trajectory gamma which contains a point P, the P being the equilibrium, and here is your trajectory. Then they want to know, this is called a convergence theorem in the, in the dynamics literature, when is omega gamma the singleton consisting only of P? When does that happen? This is a fundamental question. And as you can imagine, often you just have to answer this case by case. This is exactly <coughs> what it means to go from sequential soliton resolution to continuous in time soliton resolution. It's the exact analog of this. And so what Brunovsky politics say, without going into too many details, if the flow restricted to the center manifold is stable, orbitally stable, and if the unstable manifold has some compactness, for example, it's finite dimensional, then if this fails, there has to be another point in the omega limit set on the unstable manifold. This is quite natural because, so this is stable, unstable. If this is orbitally stable, then your trajectory should come infinitely often close to a point on the unstable manifold. And if you happen to know that every limit point, every point in the omega limit set has to be an equilibrium, well then you're done because you can't have an equilibrium on the unstable manifold. Arguments of this type, this is truly the brunovsky politic theorem from 92 that I just described to you. It's a very short paper, but it builds on, you know, the construction of Chen Hill Tan that says that you actually do have these manifolds. They build them by um, laponov Perron method. All right, so this is of no help to us. We don't have such an invariant manifold, so just in the back of our minds, we had this, these concepts floating around. Um, all right, so if the theorem fails, this is the fourth bullet point, then infinitely often you have to stay away from zero with this delta, this infimum of all possible configurations by an amount eta. And then the key is that by energy dissipation and the sequential soliton resolution, you could then find a sequence of times um, which is not too far apart, that's the t and minus sigma and much less than rho and squared, parabolic scaling, so that along the sigma n you come arbitrarily close to the multi-soliton, multi um, bubble configurations. That's how you can think of it as a manifold, multi-bubble configuration. So we approach this manifold arbitrarily closely infinitely many times and then you have this kind of situation which you have to lead to a contradiction. So no infinitely many um, trips. And absolutely crucial to now lead this to a contradiction, which takes some time, is this notion of collision interval and minimal collision energy, which is exactly what Yende and Lori had in their wave maps paper. So where, is, where are the estimates? You need some kind of quantitative control. Well, I will be very brief here. To all of you, this is kind of obvious. You integrate the heat equation by parts against ut phi squared. What could be easier? ut is a tangent field. Then the nonlinear term, is it somewhere? No, drops out. 
and you get an energy stability type estimate. Somewhat surprising is that you go can also go backward in time, but you're not solving backward in time, which you cannot do for a heat equation. But the second inequality, which seems to go in the wrong way, that says that um, at a previous time, your energy is controlled by the later time, no? so that's backwards. But you pay a price, of course, which is the difference in energies, which drops out in the first line because its energy is decreasing in time. All right, so this controls the energy on parabolic regions, and it also tells you this prominent, this featured prominently in previous talks in the dispersive setting. You cannot have concentration in the self-similar region. This is a universal property that one checks on case by case of critical equations. All right? This is the source, for example, in, um, I shouldn't be repeating these things, but the log-log blow-up of um, Fong and, and Pierre Raphael. You have a root big T minus little t. Well, Schrodinger and, and Heat have the same parabolic scaling, but then you have to have a log factor somewhere because you can't have self the quadratic self-similar, parabolic self-similar type um, <coughs> concentration. Somewhat surprising is that we rely on Terry Tau's parabolic Strichert's estimates. What on earth is that? I told you that um, this heat flow paper draws substantially on the wave map literature, and this is no exception. So where does this come from? This comes from Terry Tao's analysis of his own caloric gauge. Okay? We do not use the caloric gauge. We have no need for a gauge. But we use this piece. And the proof is so simple. This is our proof. It avoids dyadic decompositions. It's so simple that I'll walk you through it. So it's called Strichertz because you do it the same way. You do TT star. So look at the the second displayed, well, let's look at the first, what, what does the lemma says? It says that if you take L2 data and right hand side L1 in time, L2 in space, then you get L2 in time, L infinity in space control of the solution. L2 in time, so the Strichers. Where does this come from? Well, do TT star, you get the formula there, e to the t plus s Laplace, because you're in two dimensions, you put L infinity inside, then, of course, you get from the, from the fundamental solution of the heat flow, you get t plus s to the minus 1. And you immediately recognize this is a Hunkel transform. This is a nice exercise for students. They go crazy with it because there is a trick. You have to substitute s equals tu. If you substitute s equals tu, then the t goes into the, un the, the forcing f. And then use Minkowski. And you get something integrable in u because you get 1 plus u inverse and u minus a half. And the students, it drives them crazy. They, if you don't know this trick, how would you think of it? And so this is trivial, right? You put this L2 in time, and then you use duality, you're done. So this is Tau's parabolic Strichert's estimate. For us, it's a little bit more difficult because we need this on a Swiss cheese region. We lose control in pointwise sense in terms of the inner life of the harmonic bubbles. They might have bubbling inside. We eliminate that with the Swiss cheese region. So here is the statement. I hope it's not too technical. So assume you take data u and 0 that are close to harmonic map omega on a Swiss cheese. And you can take big L equals 0. Then you remove no holes. It's also allowed. You might have 0 holes. Then there's this dichotomy here. If you have no holes, then your parabolic scaling works. Your time tau n, of, over which you have control, goes all the way up to the spatial scale rn of the big disk squared. Otherwise, you can only go up to time epsilon n squared, where epsilon n is the inner life. That's the microscale of the, of the bubbles. How do you prove this? By a three-step argument, you first use the contraction in L infinity, then to control the right-hand side nonlinearities, you use um, Tau's parabolic Strichert's, and then you use Struve, um, non-concentration energy L4 uh, regularity improvement. All right? So this is small energy H2 control at the end. So here is this central notion that's due to my two young collaborators, the notion of minimal collision energy. This is a key definition. Okay, let me try and walk you through it. So 
There, this is about two sequences of times. The sequences of times are called sigma and tau n. They approach, if you want infinity, if t plus is infinite. If t plus is fine, I'd say 1, then they approach 1. And you have this infinite sequence of them. We call the smaller one sigma n, the bubbling time, because that's when you're close to the multi-soliton manifold. And tau n, call, we call the ejection time, because that's where you ejected from, this is only heuristic, yeah? this we don't have invariant manifolds, but you eject it from the multi-bubble um, configuration. Bubbling and ejection. That's the first and second property. So delta small, delta <coughs> separated from zero, but still small. And then you want that interval, i n in time, to be on a parabolic scale, small compared to rho n squared. What is rho n? That's the physical scale where you're actually working. Yeah, so it has, makes no sense to go beyond that because your physical, you, then you lose total control. So you have to stay within the largest possible stability scale. That's the third bullet point. And the fourth says that at bubbling time, you have quantization, of course, which you have for free because delta small means you're close to multi-bubble configuration. You have quantization of energy. So you converge to some 4, four k, um, k pi. And if k is 0, then you actually cannot have any multi-bubble, so we take k equals 1. And the lemma is that if bubbling fails, so again, argument by contradiction, then you have such a minimal k, and it's at least 1. And the proof is based on both the energy dissipation, which gives you the bubbling along a sequence of times. That's where you get the bubbling times from. Always, always this vehicle, all right? Always the um, sequential solid on resolution. And you, of course, need propagation estimates here. So what's the key lemma? The key <coughs> lemma is truly the key. That's why it's called key lemma, I suppose. And it says that if you have... So what did the previous slide say? If the theorem fails, what's the theorem? It says that delta... What did it say? It said that in one version, delta of the solution. And then here you have, say, in infinite time, you pick a, a y, and then you do root t. This tends to 0 as time tends to infinity. And in finite time, you have this. And then there is the caveat that you can allow this to move also. The center can move. But so if, so if this fails, that means you move away from the multi bubble configuration infinitely many times. And then the, we have these minimal collision um, intervals, these sigma and tau n with the positive k, the quantization of energy, everything um, after selecting a suitable subsequence. So the key is that this bubbling time, tau n minus sigma n, that time between bubbling and ejection rather, has to be large compared to the largest harmonic map scale squared. That's lambda max n squared. All right? So look at this picture. Unfortunately, it's a bit covered here, but look at this picture. What is lambda max? Lambda max comes from any multi-bubble configuration, which need not be unique, that does this for. That's, that means you have this, so again, very heuristic, you have a multi-bubble configuration. All my manifolds look the same. They always look like this. Don't ask me why. Well, I can't draw any others. Um, so you find a multi-bubble configuration. That's our Q of omega. And you come close to this. All right? But you might also have um, another one. So you come close to this. That's a written as a sequence of finitely many, of course. K is the number. So harmonic maps, and then you take the, um, the largest natural scale associated with the harmonic map. Notice this picture. In this picture, you might have picked a degree 2 harmonic map. Then this is lambda max. Or you might have picked two degree 1 harmonic maps. Then this would be lambda max. Now you will say this is very strange because, no, it's not strange because it would then take lambda max in time squared 
to create a collision between these two because they are separated by lambda max. All right? That is the logic behind this ambiguity of such a picture. So this is absolutely key and the proof sketch takes a while. But if, again, everything by contradiction, if not, then you could find these bubbling and ejection times that become arbitrarily small relative to the lambda max and squared scale, say this one here. And such that you have bubbling times sigma n twiddle and ejection times tau n. And here is an attempt at a picture that shows you what's going on. So lambda max is the big green one. Then the pink one is what? It is the root of tau n minus sigma n tilde. It is essentially the root of this, which is allowed to be much, sm much smaller than that. All right? But notice that this means that the pink one will also hardly move over that time scale because that's the stability time scale that you get from both the Struve energy stability and the, um, you know, let's call it tau L infinity bound pointwise stability. They're all on this parabolic scale. And so if the length of the interval you're working with between bubbling and ejection is that small, then the physical scale that corresponds quadratically to that will also be um, stable. But notice what's going on inside. What this shows is that you have two bubbles inside at a much smaller physical scale. So then you can do violence to those because you are now working, ev evolving the heat flow on a time scale that's much bigger than the natural time scale of those bubbles. And so on the right, this heart is not a heart, it's the merging of the two bubbles. Okay? So that's where you have a collision. And why is this a contradiction? Because then you could have from the beginning lowered your energy. Then K was not minimal. K was minimal, that's the key. So if, if you had this type of phenomenon, you could eliminate the larger scale and just work on the smaller scale and you would have a smaller K contradiction. Okay? And so now just to sh um, conclude the proof in a minute. So use the key lemma. Imagine the theorem fails, then you have these collision intervals and you have that tau n minus s n has to be at least lambda max squared. That's the square of the natural bubble of the harmonic map. And you are ejected at time um, on this whole interval. So this is slightly different what, what I said before, but you can make your interval smaller so that your distance then remains uniformly above epsilon, right? Because if you do this, eventually you have to go far away by eta, so then you go until um, you remain uniformly above epsilon on that interval Jn. And so now the claim is that lambda max n times the L2 norm of the tension has to be bounded below. If not, then you would use sequential soliton resolution. You would use your bubbling lemma to find, um, to find bubbling times within Jn, but that contradicts that the first inequality, this one. This contradicts that, that you remain separated by epsilon for all these times. And why is that finally a contradiction? Well, because if you have this inequality on the whole time interval, then look at this integral. This is finite, then you break it up into these intervals. You pass the subsequence, you can assume they're disjoint. Everywhere on this, you have to be bigger than lambda max minus 2, but that length is at least this. So then you're summing up constants, infinitely many, so you have a contradiction. All right? So happy birthday, Frank. Um, as final speaker, I have to profusely thank the organizers, the scientific committee. So you know, you know who they are, just for sake of completeness, I listed them. And then the, the tireless, selfless guardian angel, Elizabeth. We cannot forget her, she's been amazing. Okay, thank you very much. Um, are there any questions? I have a question. Um, is there any chance, even at the conjecture mm -hmm. level,
to say something about the dynamics of the scales and the centers to expect an RTP system governing these. That is modulation theory, and that is hard. And maybe we can have a chat in a few months, and I'll have something to say. At the moment, I have no comment. Okay, so <laughs> don't know. <laughs> Somebody has one question, or uh, even two questions. One about the, uh, the JASEC uh, law of the result report. So there is a there is an N times two in the energy, which you expect to be the energy of the profile solution. The wait, wait, wait. So this theorem, wait. In the equivalent case. <laughs> and this, and then why MP? M pi, this just comes, comes from counting degrees. So there exists such an M. Should, should we interpret that as the energy of your know, It is related to the energy, um, I suppose. Um, remember that for harmonic maps, right, energy and degree are linked. Yeah. So then we, could, we can count M also from the energy if you want. Right, but asymptotically only yeah, at infinity. Yeah. Yes, only for the limit. Yes, yes, yes. Another question, perhaps. Uh, you have your orthogonal ideal condition, which in the elliptic case they could say that the level they don't interact at the uh, W1 or H1 level. Mm -hmm. The idea would be to reduce the energy and then being trapped with low energy when you have contactors. In your, do you have any other? I mean, does it has another role apart from the energy separation of bubbles when you do when you consider the heat flow and the uh, the, uh, the time? Or yeah, we need this also in the L infinity theory. So for our Swiss cheese, we want the centers to be separated. Yeah. When they collide, we. Yeah, but that would be uh, like the case. But does it have a, a, a time role? Uh, no, because we work on on t they don't move, so we work. They only feature at the bubbling times. Once you have ejection times, all of this is lost. Okay. You can only work indirectly. There is no more structure. Okay? So, but that, that structure is important at one time, but infinitely often that's the bubbling time. And then you propagate, but only on the parabolic time scale where they, at least if you, that's why we pass to the, the bigger ones. We do not control the actual mechanics of collision, indirect arguments. We know that they have to happen, but how they happen, we don't control. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions? So uh, you talked about uh, wave maps and harmonic maps. So is there a way to understand the class of equations <coughs> that you could address by this method? Um. It's, so I can't think of an abstract theorem that would say, th are you thinking of a class of PDEs to which this would apply, or? For instance, uh, Are you thinking of Kinsburg land or? <laughs> <laughs> no, not necessarily. More like NLS. Or yeah, so, yeah, NLS is an interesting topic. Um, maybe you're thinking of Schrodinger maps, right? Because that's a geometric. Equation related to this. So, so maybe the, the ingredients you need to have a priori to start working on. Ah, well, on an abstract level, this does split into some kind of modular structure. So you need the sequential bubbling. We have this from the 90s. And then you need the stability, which is also a module. And then you combine it with these dynamical ideas involving minimal collision intervals of, of Jacek and Lori. Um, yes, yeah, so it decomposes into modules. If you have, if you give me a PDE that has these modules, then it should work. Mm -hmm. yeah.